Hello, my name is Adrian Goldberg and welcome to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times, it's what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This time, the life and death of Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner Mercenary Group, whose troops supported the regular Russian army in Ukraine before launching a short-lived rebellion against Vladimir Putin. The cause of the plane crash in which he died is still unknown but it conforms with a familiar pattern of those who have crossed the Russian president. So who was Prigozhin and how will his death influence the outcome of the war? There's no better guide than Zarina Zabrisky, who has been writing about him for both the Byline Times and the Euromaidan Press, and who grew up in the same city as Prigozhin and Putin, St. Petersburg. Before we hear from Zarina, a quick reminder that the Byline Times podcast is funded by subscriptions to the Byline Times. That's our brilliant monthly newspaper, which combines the best of our online offerings with content that you can't read anywhere else. We are the news outlet that exposed the Dan Wooden story when others chose to look the other way. And that was a three-year investigation. So do support us if you can. Find out how to subscribe over at bylinetimes.com. That's at bylinetimes.com. Welcome then, Zarina. And I think it's important to clarify in terms of Prigozhin that he and Putin go back a long way and their mutual success is intertwined right from the very beginning of their respective careers. Yes. Hi, Adrian. And hi, everyone. And I also want to clarify that I'm currently speaking to you from another city. Uh, It is Odessa in Ukraine, which is currently and for the last 18 months has been targeted by the people from the city where I partially grew up. Part of my childhood was spent in Odessa. And it is correct that I know the atmosphere in which two of these characters came to be such an influence on our life because you want it or not, but these events are now the talk of the globe. And what I find somewhat upsetting, Adrian, is that the world still doesn't grasp the essence of Putin's mafia state. And this brings us to the very root of your question, to the beginning of the Russian mafia state or by now empire or wannabe empire as we know it. In brief, in a nutshell, and we spoke about it many times on the podcast here on Byline Times, and I wrote about it. There were certain strata of the former Soviet Union, of the decaying structure that used to be the USSR, that came together. And in a very strange development, it united and blended together organized crime, the bandits, small crooks, which Prigozhin certainly was. He served 10 years in prison for robbery, for actually pulling earrings out of a woman's ears and such. And Putin, who was known to be stealing washing machine in Germany on his assignment, and former military who became obsolete when the Soviet Union fell apart. And that will bring us back uh, to the generals who are the part of the whole picture and the whole alleged crash and alleged murder that we're talking about, and security services, which are a very important part of the equation, because both Prigozhin and the actual founder of Wagner, Dmitry Utkin, worked for the Russian intelligence services, of which the so-called erroneously called private military company Wagner was a part of, it worked for the Russian state, being a part, again, of the Russian military intelligence service. And so all of these parts came together. There were other parts too, and I wrote about it at multiple occasions. There were athletes, there were priests who used to be FSB agents. And all of this created this ugly mass that we call the Russian state and which operates as a common mafia. So what we see now, briefly, there is a turf war. And if we approach what's happening from this point of view, we have a much more clear picture. 
Going right back to the start of Prigozhin's ascent, though, as you say, he was a criminal, convicted criminal who served years behind bars, but somehow emerged in this chaotic period of Russian history to own a boat which served as a, a restaurant. He became known as Putin's chef because Putin used to entertain some of his high-flying business guests and dignitaries there and his political allies. And Prigozhin himself, with Putin's assistance, became the head of a major food organisation. And you've spoken to me about this concept before of something called Krisha. Krisha is the idea of the house, the roof, that protects us all. And their interconnection was so great, and it's part of a wider series of interconnections in Russian society, that once you're protected by the roof, you are expected always to look after other members of those who are under that roof. We would call it, as you say, a, a mafia-style operation. But there was a, this was a mafia-style operation that ended up running Russia. Yes, exactly. And it, the Krisha doesn't necessarily protect us all. It protects only those who serve to this particular Krisha. And various bandits have various uh, luck in their lives. So those especially lucky, you know, quote unquote, take it with a grain of salt, have Putin and the FSB as their Krisha. Because on the one hand, it gives you this unlimited opportunities to make this immense, obscene amount of money. On the other hand, your life doesn't belong to you anymore. And this very money that you're after doesn't belong to you either. All of this can be gone in a wink of a second. And we've seen it multiple times. We have the reports of oligarchs and businessmen slipping on uh, the proverbial banana or falling out of the windows or losing the balance in saunas. And this crash, the plane crash that we had the reports of last night, is the result of Prigozhin and Utkin working for Putin and the FSB as Krisha. And the FSB, just so we're clear for people who don't know, is Russia's National Security Service. It is, I suppose, their equivalent of, what would it be, the FBI or the CIA? It's the former KGB. You know, there's also GRU. There's like, we probably shouldn't jump now all the definitions because they're not really parallels. They're different. All we need to know that they're security services. They're extremely powerful. And of course, most people know that Putin used to be the KGB officer. That was his major career before he became the Russian president. And we also know that they say that once the security uh, service officer in Russia, you never quit. Once the KGB, always the KGB, and once the FSB, always the FSB. So until recently, until very recently, Prigozhin would have operated under their protection. And he didn't found the Wagner Group, as you've explained, but he became its charismatic figurehead. He was somebody who loved to be pictured in the field of military operations, not only in Ukraine, but in other parts of the world as well. And in your writing, you're keen to ensure that we understand that the Wagner Group is not, as it's often described, simply a mercenary group operating on a freelance basis. This is a group that may operate at arm's length from the Russian government, but only acts in accord with the wishes of the Russian government, in accordance with the Kremlin's desires. Yes, exactly, Adrian. It's a secret subdivision of the main directorate of the general staff, which is the GRU, formerly known as the main intelligence directorate. So why do we refer to it as a private military company? It's because the mistakes like this often happen. Western journalists take something familiar and just project it on the entity that somehow reminds them of what they know. So journalists started to apply this term, PMC, to Wagner Group, 
and everybody started to do it. But it actually is subsidiary of the uh, Ministry of Defense. So in reality, they were reporting to Shoigu. And Putin himself confirmed that three days after the mutiny, which was 23rd of 2023. And on the 27th of June, Putin, who kind of seemed to have lost his bearing and said a lot of different strange things that he didn't say before, made this televised appearance and said clearly in clear Russian that the Ministry of Defense was providing funding for Wagner Group And he named the number. He said it was about the equivalent of $1 billion. And this group operating in Ukraine was recruiting from prisons. It was recruiting from what you might say were the dregs of Russian society. And even within the scope of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and some of the atrocities that have taken place there, the Wagner Group was responsible for some of the worst atrocities. That is correct. That is important to remember. And I think there was a purposeful move to recruit the convicted murderers and individuals with uh, mental issues who don't have the normal amount of empathy in order to carry out the terrorist policy because it instills fear. Generally, the say the civilians in occupied territories naturally are more afraid of convicted murderers and rapers than even of the regular military. And I heard that a lot in the in the liberated territories. Also, it is worth mentioning a couple of things here that Wagner was not founded by Prigozhin. It was founded by Dmitry Utkin, whose code name was Wagner. And Wagner is a reference to Richard Wagner, the German composer, which was appropriated by the Third Reich and was Hitler's famous composer. And this code name was taken and adopted by Utkin especially. And it always surprises and shocks me that people don't make this parallel. That was a neo-Nazi formation from the start go. And ironically, and in a twist very characteristic for Putin's Russia, this very entity, right, or a part of the Ministry of Defense with a clear neo-Nazi name was carrying out the main purpose of the special a military operation, which is an aphemism for the war in Russia. You can't say war. You have to say special military operation. And the main purpose of it, as specified by Putin, was denazification of Ukraine. So they sent the self-proclaimed Nazis to denazify people who actually are not Nazis, Like at some point you reach the level where your brain stops coping with that. But that's the reality. Furthermore, uh, many of these individuals initially in in the original Wagner, which uh, started in about 2014 by Dmitry Utkin, belong to so-called Rodna Veri. It's a religion slash ideology, which not very sophisticatedly mixes some Nazi ideas with some Bolshevism ideas, with very racist ideas, very pro-Slavic, has a lot of Nazi-looking symbols. People have tattoos of just swastikas and also like Slavic versions of swastikas. And there's plenty of work on that. I wrote about it. There are in-depth reports. And they never made a secret out of it. Their pictures of Utkin and his fellows giving the Nazis salute. Also, Putin awarded Utkin. And there's a photograph of Utkin standing next to Putin in the Kremlin. What better connection could be? So what happened? These were, like, basically speaking in, you know, simple terms, for a lack of better term, vassals of the Kremlin who suddenly were not 100% loyal. And Putin just doesn't take anything but 100% loyal. He wouldn't take any dissidents. 
no matter which specter of opposition, you know, anywhere from Boris Nemtsov killed on the bridge, shot into his back, to Navalny, of course, poisoned, to businessmen like Khodorkovsky, who was imprisoned for trying to go through the business side of the mafia, to, which qualifies as a rebellion as well, to open mutiny, which of course is a no-no. And so the fact that the crash happened on the 23rd of August, which is exact date of the, you know, two months anniversary mark of the uh, mutiny, which happened on the 23rd of June, has Putin written all over it because, A, he loves symbolism. He's obsessed with numbers. Everything happens on a certain sacral date. It's kind of predictable. We know what to expect. But also, conveniently, it happens to be on the night of Ukrainian National Flag Day, running into the Ukrainian Independence Day, which is a major holiday here in Ukraine. Everybody's out on the street uh, celebrating their independence with vengeance because we've been fighting back for such a long time. So it would be very convenient in theory and very Putin-like to blame SBU, which are Ukrainian secret services, on somehow implanting a bomb into Prigozhin's jet and then calling for vengeance and calling like a major blow on Kiev, Odessa, you name it. So using it, you know, getting rid of unloyal vassals and blaming it at the same time on your main political adversary and finding a reason. Not that anybody needs a reason at this point, but that's how logic works. And this is something that is so important to understand. I guess the two major things here, we're dealing with mafia. Do not apply your regular logic, your expectations. Do not project your thinking, especially if you happen to listen to me from the United States, the United Kingdom, France, you know, anywhere if from a democratic country, flawed as we are, because I am an American, despite my accent, for those of you who don't know, I'm an American citizen. I spent most of my conscious life in the United States. I know how people think there, but I also grew up in the former post-Soviet empire, and I know how things work here. This is day and night. It's mimicry for something that you know. It looks like it, but it is not at all. And another thing to know is that the logic of this mafia state works in some theatrical staged way. There's always some sort of spectacle, which is unclear to us from the West. Why is it needed to us, to most of us, the majority of uh, the international community at this point, Putin is a villain, like he's certainly on the side of evil, but it is not so for the brainwashed Russian population, it is not so for the Kremlin. They believe that they are the saviors of the world. And they need to stage the spectacle with which I grew up with, when everything is a backdrop. Nothing is behind this backdrop. It's a Potomkin village. Like you you poke a hole behind it and you see this darkness and poverty and, and the horror, the horror, the horror, you know, of the heart of darkness. But not for them. Like, listen to Dugin, du uh, Dugin, who is the main ideologist of uh, Putin, whose daughter was assassinated this year earlier and killed another ideologist, by the way. He already came up with something like pray for Prigozhin and the enemies of Russia assassinated Prigozhin. And he might be actually believing it ridiculous at the sound to us. So do not apply the logic of a normal human being to these individuals. It doesn't work that way. Why did Prigozhin fall out with Putin to the extent that he led this aborted mutiny, this march on Moscow, which eventually came to nothing? Well, again, I mean, it's a great question. And the answer, I don't want to repeat myself. It's seemingly absurd. What kind of culmination, what kind of 
way out could he possibly be expecting, right? Rebelling against the army that outnumbers him and calling for the infamously passive population that is afraid to open the door, you know, and step out. Nothing happens in Russia, right? He couldn't have possibly expected that the uh, thousands would like go after him and march on Moscow. The answer is do not apply the logic to it. There's no logic. This is a person who spent 10 years of his formative years in prison. He has the thinking of, uh, first of all, of a thug, and secondly, of a criminal. They have their own system of beliefs. They live by understanding, by panatia. It's a different kind of laws. You know, it's a world where the murder is acceptable, but the torture is the way to go to reach your goals. And also, this is a person who spent the last 10 years of his life in various conflicts and war zones, and there is no logic there. Basically, we're dealing with a bunch of lunatics. I know it doesn't sound like a political analyst lingo, but let's address it and name things for what they are. It's a different mentality. And from our standpoint, this is a mentality of unstable individuals. We should stress that we don't know the cause of the plane crash in which Prigozhin died as we record this, and we should just have due caution around that. But I think it's fair to say that anybody who crosses Putin is likely to come to a sticky end, and Prigozhin presumably would have known that, but made this decision to launch a mutiny, then backtracked, and there's a sense that his ending was inevitable. I also want to comment here along these very lines that there was no official confirmation of Prigozhin's death at this point. There were a record of 10 people killed, the list of names of people who allegedly boarded the plane, but so far his body hasn't been identified. His phone was found according to many sources, but we don't have any official confirmation. And I've heard many, many versions that include the version that Prigozhin wasn't on the plane, that it was staged by the FSB. I wouldn't exclude it entirely. It is unlikely. So it looks, it looks again, with emphasis on looks, like it would be typical Putin's move. But we don't know anything for certain. Like I said before, Everything is a spectacle. I will not be surprised if in a week Prigozhin pops up somewhere in Africa and they blame everything on the Kiev regime. Which brings us to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And obviously you're in Ukraine at the moment, as you say, in Odessa. Is Prigozhin's death likely to have any impact? And if so, what will that impact be on the conflict in Ukraine? Well, yes, I I was uh, with a few friends yesterday. We were celebrating the national flag day when the news started to arrive. And some people were like, oh, what does it matter? It's just like one other babe person gone. And so we had a little bit of a discussion. Well, I can tell you the direct impact Uh, When I was heading back home, I stopped by a store and the line to buy alcohol was uncharacteristically long. Ukrainians don't drink that awfully these days, but obviously everybody was celebrating. They were like honking in the street and there was a lot of excitement because there's a sense of justice and there's a sense of expectation of more because, you know, after, there were a lot of memes. After Prigozhin, Ukraine expects Putin to follow the steps, follow the collapse. Whether Prigozhin's alleged death leads to it, probably not. But it does indicate the chaos and instability in Putin's Russia. And that is a good symptom because the more people Putin has to fight, the less stable he is. And hopefully at some point, the Russian empire will implode. 
I personally do not expect any good outcome even in this scenario. But, however, it could be good for Ukraine because while there is some infighting back in Russia, they might not have the resources to continue the war on Ukraine. We shall see. And I should stress that there's always a short time lag between recording these episodes and editing them and publishing them. But as we speak, just to confirm that Prigozhin's death has not been confirmed. And in 2019, he was reported dead in a plane crash, only to emerge three days later. We shall see what happens. But in any event, it has been a fascinating insight into the world of Putin, Prigozhin, of Krisha, the Krisha that until recently had protected Prigozhin. And really grateful for your insight, as always, Zarina. You can read Zarina Zabriski in the Byline Times and also in Euro Maidan Press, where she reports regularly from Odessa. My name is Adrian Goldberg. This has been a We Bring Audio production for the Byline Times, produced by me and Harvey White. Thanks very much indeed for listening. We'll see you again very soon. Don't forget to take out a subscription to the Byline Times. Get details over at bylinetimes.com. We'll see you soon. Cheers now. Bye-bye.